Well, as we um, continue, we're going to uh, dive uh, just right into um, Acts uh, this morning, um, looking at uh, kind of a, a change of scenery here as, this, as Paul and company uh, are uh, going from city to city. Uh, we're going to see them go to a new city now. Uh, we saw that last week uh, they had gone through some persecution, got thrown into prison. They've been released now, and now they're moving forward um, but what's so cool about uh, today and then um, in the next coming weeks, next, uh, not so much next week, next week we'll, uh, we have this kind of cool little parenthetical break in Acts, but the, between today and then in two weeks, the next few weeks after that, uh, we're going to see a lot about uh, Paul's approach to evangelism, uh, his approach to uh, sharing his faith with people uh, in these communities, in these cities uh, that are very much uh, not versed in the scriptures. Uh, a lot of times we see him going to uh, towns with a lot of uh, Jews that are there, so they have kind of a background, a history in knowing the scriptures, knowing the Old Testament. They have a general um, starting point that they agree on. But sometimes we see him going into towns that are very unlike that. Uh, Greek towns, uh, pagan towns, where there's no um, kind of starting point that uh, is agreed upon. Uh, they don't agree that the Old Testament scriptures are God's word. They don't agree that there's only one God. So they're really starting from scratch sometimes when they go into some cities, whereas other cities, they're going in where they actually have some kind of agreement. Uh, and in our day and age, uh, you might find, a, you're going to find a little bit of both, right? You're going to find people who grew up in a church or grew up at least in some type of a church where they have a general belief in maybe a singular God, but, but a lot of times, and more increasing in our culture, uh, we're seeing a lot of people that have thrown that out the window. So, uh, so the next few weeks, uh, so today and then uh, three weeks as we get into um, Paul and crew getting into Athens, um, we're going to be looking specifically at sharing our faith. We're going to be looking specifically at just evangelism, uh, what we can learn from Paul and company uh, as they share their faith, even in very pagan uh, communities. And that, to me, is one of the hardest things I think that a lot of Christians run into uh, and even uh, if you remember a couple months ago when I had uh, you guys write down on connection cards things you want to grow in, things you want to get more confident, whether it's uh, parenting, marriage, whatever, um, a lot of you wrote down evangelism. Uh, you wrote down just being able to share your faith at work or share your faith at school or in your community. Uh, that was one of the, one of the um, highest remarked ones on those connection cards. And so as uh, I was looking through those, and you know, some of those things were parenting, which so we, you know, we're, we're doing the parenting workshop. But with this one here, I was looking forward in Acts, and I thought, man, right here is a perfect spot as we get into today's going to be Thessalonica, uh, and then in two weeks we're going to get into Athens. Uh, and these two particular uh, parts of Scripture, we really get to see Paul demonstrate uh, how he shares his faith. Uh, and so, so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at that specifically, which was a, a great timing because this was something that you guys even have asked for. You're saying, I want to learn how to share my faith more. So, uh, so we're going to be spending the next few weeks really uh, looking at that specifically as we see the example that, uh, that Paul gives us uh, in uh, the book of Acts. Now, in some ways, when it comes to sharing our faith, some people might say, well, it's just, it's just it's simple. You know, it's just simple. You just open your mouth, you just share the gospel. But that's, in reality, that's not really, it's not, it's not that simple, first of all. Uh, but that's not even simple for a lot of us. Uh, it's kind of like I said last week, you know, with uh, little kids learning how to play baseball, their plate approach, right? A coach just says, just go hit the ball. It's like, well, thanks, Dad, but you know, how? Right? It's, it's not just as simple as just, just go preach the gospel, just go open up your mouth. That sounds simple, sounds simple enough, but as I've mentioned many times, we have to first start with not just knowing the word, but we have to also then value the word. You can't just go open your mouth. You have to first know the word, value the word. We have to have a love for the people that we're going to, right? Because if you go and just open your mouth, that could be devastating, right? If you don't love the people you're talking to, I would actually say, shut your mouth until you start loving them, right? So it's not just a matter of just go open your mouth and just preach the gospel. That's we have to have a better pro plate approach than that. So we have to love the people that we're going to go and, and, and share with. We have to also have a, a, a love for the Lord where, first of all, we want to share the gospel, right? So that's got to be there. It can't just be loving the people, but we have to love the Lord. We have to 
personally have a, a passionate love for Jesus, for him to be the center of our life, our greatest desire, that's, that's the only time that we're going to come to where now we actually want to share him is when he becomes the center of our life. So, so it's not just a matter of just open your mouth. There's a lot of other foundational things that have to happen in our lives before we even get to a place where we even should or even have a desire to open our mouths in the first place. Now, all that said, we're not going to get into all those foundational things. Because we cover that a lot, like just kind of over the months, just having Christ be the center, uh, loving the people uh, around us. So we're going to assume that, not that I do assume that we're all walking in that, but we're going to assume that for now and look at some of the practicals that we even see Luke describe how Paul shares his faith. So we're going to step beyond some of those foundational things and assume that we have at least some of those things or at least that we're working on those things. We're working on loving people, working on loving the word of God and valuing the word of God. So we're gonna look today at then how do we actually engage people if those other things are already in place? Because we know that Paul has those foundational pieces in place, right? We know that he knew and valued God's word. We know that he, he loved his listeners. We know that he had a deep love for Christ. So he's at a good place to start and just go out and just open his mouth because he already had these foundational pieces. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to spend three weeks looking at this topic even more deeply, the evangelism and sharing our faith. Because as I mentioned, Paul's going to be in Athens, which is a very pagan city. And the way that he goes about his sharing of the gospel is going to be, I hope, very helpful to us and giving us examples of how to share our faith. And hopefully today, in this sermon today, we're going to get a little bit of a preview of that, seeing what Paul does in Thessalonica as kind of a preview of what he does even in Athens. So let me pray, and um, we're going to be uh, continuing in Acts, uh, looking at this, uh, this kind of a turn of scenery. We'll, we'll catch up a little bit on how everything uh, ended in uh, Philippi, but then we're going to be looking at uh, them arriving in Thessalonica. Father, we thank you that uh, your word is so descriptive. Um, it doesn't just give us concepts. Uh, it doesn't just give us um, sort of uh, theological gymnastics, uh, but it's very practical as well. Uh, it gives us real life human encounters with people. The Psalms give us uh, emotional encounters. As we even just were singing through that song earlier and Pastor Tyler was sharing, just, it just it, it causes, it gives us an, an aid, a light to help us through our ups and downs in our week and our day and our month. And here even today, we get to see um, kind of the, the technique, I guess, or the, the practicals of how Paul shares his faith. Uh, and we know that there's uh, not just one way to share our faith. There's not just one way of evangelism. But today, we're going to be looking at specifically how he engaged the Thessalonians. In a couple of weeks, we'll be looking at the Athenians, how he shared with the Athenians. And so I just love that your word gives us so many different examples based on the different situations, the different people. And so I, I would ask and pray, Lord, that this morning uh, your word would equip us in a specific way to help us get a little insight into maybe how we can add tools to the toolbox of our faith and us walking out our faith and being doers of our faith as we aim and desire with hopefully a love and value of the scriptures, a love and value of you and love and value of our listeners we hope to add some tools to the toolbox and sharpen us a little bit in how we can have conversations with the non-believers in our lives, those that we love deeply and those that we've never met before. Um, we just we want to have some tools that we can add and sharpen the tools maybe that we already have so that we can more, be more effective ministers and ambassadors for Christ. So help us today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. We love you. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as this story continues, we see that in verses 35 and 40, uh, through 40, that the magistrates back in Philippi, they let Paul and Silas go. And it's kind of a funny exchange if you read through it because the magistrates, they, they kind of realize they made a mistake. We beat these guys and imprisoned them. We probably shouldn't have. They're Roman citizens. What we did was kind of illegal. 
Uh, they have a little bit of egg on their face. So what they do is they want to secretly let these guys go like, hey, hey, we cool, right? You guys can just go. And like, nothing to see here. We're, we're good. And then Paul, being a little ornery here, he just, he goes, no, nah, no, nah, bro. Like, nah, that's not how this is going to go down. You're going to actually apologize publicly to us. So Paul's just kind of like, you're just going to let us like sneak out the back door? And no, 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 no. No, you, we're going to make a display out of this. I, I love Paul's kind of brashness here. If you see it in verse 37 here, Paul says, they've beaten us publicly, uncondemned. We're, we're uncondemned. We're men who are Roman citizens, and they've thrown us into prison, and now they want to throw us out secretly so that, so that they don't have to face up to what they did? No, 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 no. No, let them come themselves and take us out. So they sent word to the jailer, hey, sh- just, just let them go. And Paul's like, no, that's not how this is going to work. I want you to come down and release me personally, and I want you to publicly display me so that everyone knows what you did was wrong. So the police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out, and they asked them to leave the city. But what I love, too, about this is uh, Paul and, and Silas, they didn't, leave, they didn't leave Philippi discouraged or in fear They didn't leave immediately, even though they said, hey, leave the city. What they did is they actually went and said their goodbyes. They went on, uh, before they're going on this three-day journey, look what it says in verse 40. So they went out of the prison and they visited Lydia. They didn't leave the city. They didn't like, you know, go, okay, yeah, we're going to leave right away. They're just going, man, you guys, you're not going to just throw us out and act like nothing happened. We're going to take our time. We're going to go and visit with Lydia a little bit, encourage her, this new church in Philippi. And once they had seen the brothers and they gathered together with their people, they encouraged them and then they departed. So they're just basically saying, we're not going to do this your way. You guys totally blew it. You know it. We're going to take our time getting out of Philippi. Now, continuing in Acts 17, verse 1, it says, when they passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, so three consecutive Saturdays, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So, even, so a lot of women also uh, were listening in and now decided to follow Paul and Silas. So this journey from Philippi to Thessalonica is about 100 miles, takes about three days. And Thessalonica is a town of about 20,000. So it's a pretty big town. So there is a synagogue here, uh, even though this was mainly a, a, a Greek a pagan town, uh, but there was at least a synagogue here, unlike in Philippi, which is a smaller town, didn't already have a synagogue. So today we're going to be seeing hopefully some great insight into Paul's approach in sharing the gospel. Here in his first interactions with the Thessalonians, Luke gives us a kind of a three-part description of what Paul does. And the the cool thing is that there is a simplicity to it. He, He wanted to meet people where they were at, what they already understood. He wanted the gospel to be accessible to them and not seem like a foreign language. So Luke says that Paul, over the course of three Sabbaths, it says he reasoned, he explained, and then he proved these three particular things. So the first one, it says that he reasoned. Now in the Greek, which is what this was written in originally, this is the word dialogue. Okay, so when it says he reasoned, this wasn't a monologue, him just talking at them telling them about Jesus, telling them about truth. He reasoned with them. He had a dialogue with them. He spoke with them. He listened to them. There was back and forth. Questions are asked. Questions are answered. They're probably asking questions. He's probably asking questions. There was a dialogue. They were being reasonable with each other as they discussed things. So he starts off reasoning with them in a conversation, not a one-sided sermon, not a one-sided monologue. He's not just getting up on a soapbox and preaching, right? And, and I, I want you to think through this real quick before we get a little further here. When it comes to evangelism, we think of obviously just our, our non-believing friends and family, 
But I want also you parents, I want you to think about your kids, right? When your kids are younger, right? How do, you, how do you present the gospel to them? How do you present morality to them? How do you present God's law to them? Is it just tell them what to believe, tell them what to think, tell them what's in the Bible? Or are you actually reasoning with them, conversing with them, asking them questions, letting them ask questions? Or are you monologuing, right? I, I remember when I was growing up, I got really good at just like when my parents would, particularly my dad, when, when he would uh, uh, just kind of monologue to me, I just got really good at just going, uh-huh, Mm, mm, uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like not listening to anything because he's monologuing. Kids check out quickly when parents monologue, right? So having a dialogue, reasoning, engaging in conversations, because especially when your kids are younger, when you want them to understand their faith, you can't just speak at them. You have to engage with them. So this is for adult non-believing friends and family, but it's also for our kids. So anytime I'm in a conversation with a a non-believing friend of mine, whether they have a church background or not, or when it's my kids when they're younger, and I did my share of monologuing for sure, so I'm not saying I was exempt for that, but I always, always, always ask a lot of questions. When I'm talking with anyone who I know doesn't know the Lord, or I'm not sure if they know the Lord or whatever, I ask lots of questions. I oftentimes don't even give my insights, give my thoughts, unless I'm asked, if they ask a question, but I'm mostly doing information gathering. I'm mostly trying to get to know them. I'm trying to get to know their heart, trying to get to know what their background is. Why do they believe what they believe? Why don't they believe what I believe? So I'm asking lots of questions. I'm not just talking at them, telling them what I believe. I'm not being quick to get there. I wanna get to know them. I want to really hear what's, because we know, we know from the scriptures that whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, so I want them to speak. I, I, I can do plenty of speaking. I can, I can talk forever. I know, you guys know that too. <laughs> I can talk forever. I want them to talk. I already know my heart. I already know what's in the word of God. I know all that, but what I don't know is what's in their heart, so I need them to speak. This is why monologuing to your kids isn't always the best thing. You want your kids to speak because you want to know what's in their hearts. You gotta know what's in their hearts. You gotta know what's in your friend's hearts, your coworkers' hearts. That's the only, that's when you find those open doors of, oh wow, I saw they've got some hurts from their childhood or from their parents, whatever it is. So I know kind of a little bit, know how to, how to navigate this relationship a little bit better. I know what scriptural truth might be more helpful for them than others. But if they don't speak, if it's just you speaking, you're not gonna get probably very far. In James chapter one, verse 19 James says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, quick to listen, and slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Being a quick listener, slow to speak. You ever talk with someone and when you're you're kind of sharing a story, you can see on their face, they're like ready for you to be done so they can kind of share their part. You know what I'm talking about? Right, like you can almost tell they're not even listening to you because they already have something they want to say. Right, whether it's a conversation with a non-believer or it doesn't matter, whether it's a conversation about a hobby, whatever it is, you can tell when people aren't really actually listening to you, they're just waiting for their turn. You know what I'm talking about? Don't be that person. When it says quick to listen, it doesn't just mean patiently endure until they shut up. That's not what that means. It means actually listen. Listen to what they're saying. Think about what they're saying. Be respectful about listening. Don't just sit there and just wait, like, can you just be quiet so I can talk? Because I got truth I got to share with you. Mm -mm. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Listen to what they're sharing. Don't just wait for your turn. Right? You, I, you can see it on their faces sometimes. They're just getting locked and loaded, ready to, like, to go as soon as you close your mouth. Have genuine dialogue. And if that's hard for you, if you're just like, I can't believe the words coming out of these people's mouths, I can't wait just to like, show them up or whatever, then you need to just pray in those moments, Lord, help me to genuinely love these people and care about what they're saying. And I, I do that a lot too. Like I, I will pray while people, I'm still trying to listen but I will pray oftentimes when I'm listening, if I'm just going, I can't believe what they're saying, I say, Lord, give me wisdom, give me patience, help me to really have empathy to understand why they're saying what they're saying. I don't wanna be quick to anger, 
like James says. Sometimes people say things that just kind of gets me a little triggered. I, you know, I just go, I got to be slow to anger here. What they're saying is offensive, but I don't want to be quick to anger because the, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's not going to help the situation if I elevate my anger level, if I escalate. So I want to have genuine dialogue. Paul treated these guys with respect and with dignity. He dialogued with them. He reasoned with them. And we're going to see that more even when we get to Athens in a couple of weeks. He meets them where they're at. He has a dialogue. We have to give others room to, to, to think and to move, right? They don't believe what we believe. So we can't expect them to go from A to Z instantly. We have to let them kind of go through their thoughts and verbalize things that maybe you totally disagree with, but you got to be able to listen to them. You got to be able to hear them, understand that they don't, they haven't walked the life you have. They've walked their own life. So you want to understand them. So we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And then it says that Paul explained. So after dialoguing, after kind of getting a lot of information, after kind of hear, like really genuinely listening, answering questions, him asking them questions, being thoughtful, being engaging, after all that, considering their stance on things, he went from there and then he began to explain his views, explain the gospel, explain scriptural truths. There's a great description in Nehemiah about how the Levites, the Levites were the tribe given uh, to the, the priesthood. And they were the, that was the tribe that would teach the people, uh, the other uh, 11 tribes, teach them about the word of God. A great description in Nehemiah that explains how the Levites did this uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 7, actually verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 7. The Levites, they helped the people to understand the law. So that, all that right there, that's important enough, right? The Levites helped the people understand. That's huge. Didn't just speak at them. Didn't just preach at them. The Levites helped the people understand. That means they're, they're patient. That means they understood that people were at different levels of understanding. They probably didn't, hopefully didn't get frustrated when people didn't get it. So they helped the people understand the law while the people remained in their places. So it's probably similar to this. The Levites are here. The, the people are sitting down, remaining in their places. And the Levites are helping them understand the law. It says they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly. So they read God's word, but they didn't just read God's word. They didn't just recite truth from the scriptures. They also, they gave the sense of the word. Right? They didn't just read it verbatim. They gave the sense of it so that the people understood the reading. It wasn't just like drive-by scripture reading, you know, like boom, 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 boom. Here's a bunch of truth. Go and sin no more. No, they took the time to actually explain it and give the sense of what God was actually saying in the law. Now, part of my job as a pastor is not just to read Bible verses clearly to you, right? You could just put the Bible on audio and stay at home, right? My job isn't just to read a bunch of scriptures. That'd be the safest thing for me to do, is just read scriptures to you every Sunday, and that's it. Because then no one can say, hey, that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. All I did was read the Bible. But that's not what a pastor's job is to do. Just read scriptures. You guys can read scriptures on your own. A pastor's job, just like the Levites, is to give the sense of what's going on. Now, that's the more dangerous part for a pastor, right? Because now we're going outside of just the clear word of God, and now it's our job to give the sense, to try to explain it, to help the, the listener understand what's going on. That is the hardest part of preaching because a lot of times folks can get really rigid with things. Just, just give me the word. Just give me truth. Don't add all this man-made stuff to it. But the problem is, is that part of my job is to put in things to help explain. Now, you have to define what is man-made, you know, wisdom, whatever, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that I'm supposed to give analogies and stories and explanations that are from my own life or other things I've read or whatever it is, the safest thing I could do is just read the Bible, but that's not what I'm called to do. For you as an evangelist, as a disciple of Christ, that's not just what you're supposed to do, is just go and read scriptures to people. Though that should be part of your evangelism, but that's not the only thing that we do. We're supposed to give the sense of truth, the sense of scripture, 
the sense of God's word to people in a relatable way that they can understand because they don't know the scriptures. They don't know God's truth. They don't know what sanctification means. They don't know what uh, God's sovereignty means. They don't know what righteousness is. They don't know those words. So we have to find ways to give the sense of what we believe and what's in God's word so that the people can understand. So we do it clearly like the Levites did, but we also give a sense. We want to have the, the word of God be readily applied to life in the current context that people are living in, whether they have a church background or not. And so the pastor's job, the Levite's job, is uh, because this was given to them, because every generation, every culture is going to have different nuances. So this is why the Levites in this day, but pastors today, are needed in churches because our job is to apply the unchangeable truth of God in a changeable society. How do we take these things? And then knowing that in, in every room, there's different lives and different backgrounds Right, So that's what a pastor's job is. That is what a disciple's job is. That's what an evangelist's job is. And I use, you hear me say this a lot, but it's exegeting people. It's exegeting your friends, your family, exegeting your kids, drawing out what is inside your listener. That's what exegeting is. It's excavating their heart. You can't just treat everyone as if they're the same person. If that was the case, then we would just read the Bible to people. We wouldn't give a sense of truth, a sense of things to help them understand clearly. So we have to exegete the people that we're talking to. The only way we can do that is to get them talking, which is why first Paul had dialogue. They're talking back and forth. He's, they're exposing their hearts to him when they open up their mouths. Now he can exegete them. Now he can understand them more. This is God's design. We don't live in a vacuum of just, just read the Bible to each other. We give a sense to each other. We help someone else know how I applied a certain gospel truth when I was going through this difficult situation. This is how we're designed to work together. Now there's a difference between Paul's position here and maybe even mine as a pastor or the Levites, their position. Because in this situation, we, we, we look at this and we think through the difference between what it is to be a pastor or be a Levite. Paul was a, a known teacher. The Levites, it, they knew that was their job. And so when Paul went to the synagogue, the synagogue was a specific place for discussion, theological discussion. So if you were at the synagogue, you were there to say, hey, I want to talk about stuff. Right? So the difference between that and being a Levite or a pastor and being a Christian going to your workplace, your workplace isn't a synagogue. Right, your, your, your coworkers aren't there to discuss theological things, right? So Paul, he's at the synagogue doing this. Right now we're in a church doing this. The Levites, everyone's sitting around listening to them. So the difference between what I've just described and us as individuals is that people aren't coming to you for your theological wisdom, right? So we have to make a slight adjustment here as far as understanding how then do we go from dialogue to explaining. For Paul, it was easy. They wanted him to explain. That's why they were there. Right? For you guys, it's easy. You're here because you want things explained. For the Levites and the Jews, that was easy because they wanted to have things explained. For you guys, for me, when I'm going into, you know, uh, out into the community, people aren't coming to us because they want things explained to us, explained to them. Right? So we have to make a little adjustment. We can't just go quickly from dialogue to explain as quickly as Paul did right? because there was an expectation at the synagogue. Does that make sense? Right? So, so we have to figure out then, how do we go from the dialogue part and make that transition into explaining? And this is going to be as every person in your life is going to be different on how you do this. But for Paul, for me right now, for the Levites, they already had permission. Right? Does that make sense? They had permission from the people. Right? They, they, this is expected. But when I'm in my personal conversations and I'm talking with people in my life, I, I most often, I, I wait to have people ask me for my thoughts. I'm, I'm not Pastor Joby when I'm talking to other coaches in baseball or, or neighbors or whatever. I'm not, I'm not Pastor. I, they, they could care less than I'm a pastor, right? So I'm usually waiting then for them to ask me my thoughts. I might offer my thoughts, you know, hey man, if you ever need any help working through some stuff, I, I'd love, like, I, I do that a lot. I give them the invitation. Like, if you want my thoughts, I'm here for you. And if they don't, if they don't take that, then I just go, okay, I've, I've not been invited into their life there. 
Uh, or maybe they do. Maybe they reach out later. But I most often, in my personal conversations, I, I will wait for that invitation because I know that there's an interest there. There is. They want something explained. They, they want that help. Now, that's not all the time. Sometimes I will just go in and say, hey, I'm going to tell you my thoughts with you, even though you didn't ask. Uh, it depends on the relationship. depends on the situation. depends on whether or not I think I'm going to see this person again. Right? If I have a long-term relationship, I'm usually slower. If I have a very short term, like I'm probably never going to see this person ever again, I might go straight in. So, but my default is, my general starting point, is I usually wait. I wait to kind of earn that trust or earn that invitation. So I do most of my time listening before being asked to speak. Unless I get that sense that my thoughts are actually desired in someone's life, or maybe I feel like I've already earned that right just, just by default in the relationship. But even most times, even that for me is segued in by a question. So I'm, I'm a big question asker when it comes to just engaging with my non-believing friends and family. I'm a big question asker. Um, if I'm asked to speak, then I'll ask. I might ask something like, if someone's sharing a situation with me, I'll say, hey, so, so what bums you out the most about the situation here? You know, what, what are you having the hardest time with? How are you feeling about this situation you're in? Do you know what you're going to do next? What's your plan? Oh, yeah, that's, oh, so why did you choose that instead of this? All right, so I'm, I'm trying to get a, a, an understanding of, of their desires, their heart. Uh, so I'm, if I'm going to segue into them hopefully asking my opinion, I ask those types of probing questions. Do you have a, do you have a plan already for, for this thing or you know, what, what are you going to do when you get to this spot? Whatever it might be. Uh, and then I'll ask something like, so who do, you, who do you go to in your life? Like, do you have people that you go to that you, like, you lean on a lot to make these kinds of decisions? Or when you're going through a hard time like this? Or, like, do you have people, good people in your life that you lean on? I'll ask those types of questions. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, I go to this person, that person. Sometimes they say no. And if they say no, then I'm going, hey, you know, if you ever need someone, I'd love to sit in there. I, I love talking with people when they're going through hard times, right? Whatever it might be. So I ask a lot of questions. When I want to segue from the dialogue into the explaining, I use questions as kind of my, my bridge. And the truth is that I'm still trying to learn more about the person, not just talk at them, give them unsolicited advice, or just tell them what to do. I'm trying to learn about them. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5 says the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water. Right? I want you to picture your, your non-believing friends and family. Their hearts are like deep waters, deep, deep waters. You don't know what's in there. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know what's in their past. You don't know what's in their minds. You don't know their fears, their insecurities. You don't know their pains. You don't know their bitternesses. You don't know what gives them their deepest joys. Their hearts are like deep waters. But then the next line says, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Now to draw out water from the deep takes patience, takes hard work, takes a commitment. And in a context like a relationship, it takes, it takes love, a true desire. If you really want to know the people you're talking to, if you want to draw out their heart, you have to understand that as deep waters. Sometimes we reduce people just to like what their view is, maybe what their political party is, what their lifestyle is. We reduce them just to uh, little like buckets. Like, oh, that, that person's just a whatever. That person's just a whatever. Mm -mm. Deep waters, deep waters. What you see on the surface, the labels, those are real, but they come from somewhere. They come from somewhere. Your job and my job is not just to apply labels to people, even if it's their labels they put on themselves. Our job is to exegete, to excavate their hearts and draw out their heart. Then now we can hopefully speak to those things, why they became what they became, why they believe what they believe. Instead of just blanket saying, oh, that's just a this person, that's just a that person. We're so quick to do that. We hate that people do it to us, but we love doing it to other people. It's just our default. It's easier that way. It's easier just to label people. 
But God's word says, no, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water. And if you and me, if we want to draw out people's hearts, we have to be patient. We have to ask questions. Let them expose the deep waters of their heart by their words. But if we're just talking at people, because we can't wait to share the gospel, we can't wait to share our views, we can't wait to shut down their argument, that's just pointless. You have all the knowledge and wisdom in the world, but if there's no love, it's nothing. We want to draw out their hearts. I want to draw out the heart of the people I talk to. As a dad, I want to draw out my kid's heart. So when I just monologue, mm, in one ear, out the next. My friends, family, I want to draw out their hearts, but I have to be patient. I have to do the hard work, the, the humbling work of just listening. Even when you know you've got all the right answers for the arguments, you just sometimes you just got to listen. Listen because you love them. Listen because you want to earn trust. Listen because you want them to really believe this person loves me. They're not just here just to preach at me. I got plenty of people to preach at me. But I, just, I want someone, even if they disagree, I, I want someone to actually just love me and care about me. And maybe I'll listen to their arguments. Maybe I'll listen to their discussion. Not someone who's just going to talk at me. So in my transition from going from dialogue into explaining, I do a lot of question asking because I need them to expose the deep waters of their hearts. I can't do that on my own. So I do a lot of question asking. So that's kind of still part of the dialogue, but it's moved, that's how I move into the explaining. I, what I want, remember the story of the Emmaus Road, right, where uh, the disciples after Jesus died, they're all discouraged, they're bummed out, they're walking and they're just kind of, you know, kind of weeping and just saying, oh man, I, what happened? And Jesus is there. They don't recognize Jesus. And that's when Jesus revealed himself through all the scriptures. He like starts to point out, look, the son of man, he was here, 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 here. And then they realized, they saw that this is Jesus, right? What I want to do is I want to walk with people on their Emmaus road, Right? I want to join them there. They're walking through life. They think that this is true, this is true. They think that this is false, Jesus isn't real. They're walking on their Emmaus road. I want to walk with them on their Emmaus road. And as Jesus did, just asking questions, kind of sharing with them, like, hey, remember this part in the Bible? And of course, he knew that their background, they, they believed in the Bible, so easier starting point than maybe a non-believer. But I want to walk with people on their Emmaus road. Wherever they think they're going, Wherever they're headed, I want to join them on that journey, and I want to ask questions, and I want to help maybe, you know, string some dots together and kind of ask them these kind of like, so what happens if you get that thing? What happens if you finally get to that point? Then what? Oh, I never thought about that. I just want to walk with them on their Emmaus Road. This last uh, week, uh, we had our, our, our fight club uh, with uh, maybe five or six, seven boys, um, one of the things they wanted to talk about was dating, of course, right? I always want to talk about girls. And, uh, <laughs> and they'll ask the questions, you know, hey, so, so when, when's the right age? When's the, when, when is it okay for me to date? These types of things, right? Now, this is kind of, what we do in the fight club is kind of like a synagogue, right? Like it's just, it's discussion. We're reasoning together. And I have permission to speak in their lives. I could just tell them what I believe, but I never do that. I never do that. For one, I actually respect these kids. I think they, they know how to think. So I want to help them think better. So I won't just tell them what I believe. I know better than that. Because if I just tell them what I believe, they're just going to, in their heads, just go, well, that's not right. You know, I'm just going to do my own thing. So I only go so far when it comes to that. I need to draw out their hearts if I really want to reach these boys. So the first thing I do is when they ask, coach, when is the right age to date? My first question is, well, what do you guys think? Right? That's the, that's the basic answer. First of all, what do you guys think dating even is? Can you define that for me? What do you think the purpose of it is? We have a dialogue. It's not just coach talking. They get to share all their stuff, their reasons. And so we reason together. I got to see and hear the deep waters of their hearts. And then eventually I ask, so where do you guys get your philosophy of dating? Do you get it from friends? Like, how do, you, how do you guys decide? I mean, you're asking me, but like, how do you guys decide this? Do you get it from your friends? Do you get it from your parents? Do you get it from society? And so we're still reasoning together. I'm asking them questions, but we're still reasoning. And eventually, I might turn to the explaining aspect. 
And there was an example I gave for them. I said, what do you guys do if, if a car breaks down, your car breaks down? They said, well, we take it to a mechanic. I say, well, you don't just fix it yourself? Well, no. Said, well, how come? Because well, I don't know how. Oh, so you don't know how. You've never done it. So you take it to someone who knows how to do it. Is that right? And they go, yeah. Now, what does the mechanic do? How does he know what to do? And they say, well, he has, you know, the little book from the manufacturer. I'm like, okay, so, so the mechanic goes to the manufacturer. So the mechanic isn't the end-all be-all either, but this guy is a lot more experienced, and he also has the owner's manual. He's got the manual on how to fix all these things. And so I make sure that they know I'm just a mechanic. Your parents are just mechanics. We're not the manufacturer of life, of dating, of girls, of marriage. But a good mechanic goes to the manufacturer. Doesn't just make it up like, I'm just going to throw some parts at it and we'll we'll see what happens. A good mechanic goes to the manufacturer and doesn't just give, the mechanic doesn't just give his own wisdom. He goes to the manufacturer. And so in this analogy, I'm, I'm sharing with them that even when it comes to the explaining part, I say, hey, now I'm going to start explaining. I'm going to give you my thoughts, but just so you know, I've got a higher authority over me. So I still won't tell them what I think, what I think they should believe. I'm going to give them my thoughts as a mechanic, but I'm going to tell them ultimately, you need to go to the book, not just to me. Now, by using analogies with them, like this mechanic analogy, and of course, I use a lot of baseball analogies too, because that helps them do what the Levites did with the Jews, is gives them a sense of truth. What they didn't know is that I just taught them a little bit about what's called epistemology. Now, the one time I used that phrase with them, they said, you pissed your what? (laughs) Like, no, epistemology, right? But what I did was all, I'm, I'm just telling them how to actually think through where do you get truth from? Where do you get information from? I'm, I'm walking on the Emmaus Road with them, asking them, how do, you, how do you determine what to do with life? How do you determine when you should date? Do you just make it up, or do you have a source? And my example was, go to a mechanic who knows the book, right? Because if we start thinking through, where do I make my decisions? And this is what I do with my non-believing friends. One of my go-tos also, always is going to, so where do you get that, that philosophy, of life. How'd you come up with that? Where'd that come from? Right? Because I'm going to go on that Emmaus road and what's going to happen is we're going to get to a dead end. We're going to get to a cul-de-sac. And I I love doing that with the boys because I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tease out their philosophy of different things of what they believe. And then they realize on their own, not because I told them, but because they actually got to the dead end. They're going, yeah, coach, that doesn't really make sense. Does it? I'm going, no. Should we turn around and try a different route? And so we do that. But I have to give the sense and not just tell them what I think. And I can't use foreign words to them, sanctification or whatever. Like, they don't know those words, right? So I want to give them a sense. This is why Jesus spoke in parables. Too often as Christians, we get so steeped in in Christian lingo and theological lingo, which is great for us, great for us, important for us. But we get so steeped in that slang And that Christianese, we can become so theologically versed that the words and phrases we speak just don't make any sense to people. We're supposed to give the sense to the people, but we don't make sense to people. We're speaking, we might as well be speaking in Greek or Hebrew to them because that's just as good. They don't understand what these big words mean. So we might as well just be reading from the scriptures, but reading from the original Greek or Hebrew. So I use generic words or specific words depending on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to non-believers, a lot of times I'll start off just by saying words like God or Bible or Christian. Other times I might say things like Jesus or born again or God's word or scriptures. It just kind of depends. It depends on the, the sense I'm getting from the person, their background. So I will approach different people in different ways. Sometimes even with the same person, I'll meander in between the more generic terms and then getting more specific when I really just want to kind of just kind of jab them a little bit more. We'll be talking God, 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 and then I'll say Jesus, and they're like, ooh, what? Ooh. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about Jesus. So sometimes using these generic words helps you kind of draw people in. Hey, we're on the same page here, generally. We're, we're at least speaking the same language. We're using the same glossary. We understand each other. But now you start saying words like born again, and they're going, whoa, what are you talking about? 
Like, oh, yeah, yeah, born again. And, and so you can start explaining things. So sometimes even with the same person, I'll go from generic terms and going into more specific terms. We're going to see Paul do this in a couple weeks. That's why I bring it up now, because he does that, that same type of thing. But we have to know our audience, right? Whether it's friends or family, people that grew up in the church or not, maybe background is Catholic or Jewish or Mormon, younger or older, whether it's kids or adults, we have to know our audience, and we approach them differently. And that's what we're gonna see more in a couple weeks. So the last piece here is we see Paul proving, giving evidence now. I never feel the obligation to tell people what to believe. I never feel that obligation. I, I try to enjoy a good dialogue with people, hope to present the sense of truth to them, give them evidence how I can, but I, I trust the process of how the gospel works in people's lives. I don't ever feel like I need to help the gospel or somehow jam this into people's minds, tell them what they, what they should have to believe, whatever it is. I mean, that sounds kind of weird, but I, I just don't feel like I need to actually come along the gospel and sort of force feed this thing. My job is to cast seed in water and pray that God would give the increase. The gospel does not need coercion. It doesn't work. So I present, I dialogue, I explain, and then I try to convince, but I never try to force. It just doesn't work. So evidence here, as Paul is, uh, as he's uh, trying to prove here, when we talk about evidence, this could be a step further than now going through, going beyond explaining, but now giving evidence. So you might have an appeal to, to creation, um, you know, pointing out just how the world got here, how, how, how babies, you know, grow from the, I mean, or how the eye works. I mean, all these different things. Maybe appealing to scientific or archaeological evidence or appealing to prophecies in the Old Testament. So again, it depends on your audience, depending on who you're talking to. One of my favorites that I do, because I'll speak with a lot of people maybe with no background, uh, I appeal even to philosophy or logic or critical thinking. I love getting on that Emmaus road with people. I love, I love walking out their thought process and their beliefs and their philosophy because I love when we get to that dead end and they're just kind of spinning in circles. So that's, that's one of my favorites, personally, because uh, I love conversation, I love dialogue. So I appeal, my, my evidence, so to speak, is appealing to their own philosophy or logic. It might be something like asking, so how do you go to heaven? It might just be something like that. You get the answer, will you be a good person? Well, how good is good enough? Well, I don't know. And I'll ask, have, have you even lived up to your own standards? Have you ever broken your own laws? Well, yeah. Well, then how do you expect to get into heaven? If you broke your own laws, how do you, how do you get into heaven if, after breaking God's laws? I mean, that doesn't really make sense. I'm like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So I appeal to that. It's kind of like that's my, my evidence, so to speak. So appealing to logic, appealing to creation, appealing to Old Testament prophecies, there's a number of different ways you can appeal to convincing with truth. Uh, and there's I mean, more than we can, I mean, get it in depth here, but, but that's that, that final step is like going into trying to appeal to them to convince them based on the dialogue, the explanation, and now you're kind of saying, here's why I believe what I believe. Let's think through this. Let's walk down this Emmaus road. So I, I like to appeal to logic and critical thinking. I like to, uh, how, I, how I describe that is really it's just walking people down that road and uh, having that be part of that proving experience but when we have this approach, because this, this is a very humble approach, isn't it? I mean, it's, you're not just going, you know, bah, 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 right? You're, you're actually engaging with people because you love people. Rather than having maybe a more worldly approach of owning others, or just waiting for them to be quiet so you can just kind of jump down their throat and tell them what to believe, beating our chests, or being snarky or cynical at people who don't believe what we believe. When you have this approach, which is a lot more humble, a lot more loving. This also causes us to be quite vulnerable. Because we're meek, because we're quick to listen, because we're slow to speak, and because we're slow to anger, because we're gentle, because we're patient, even with our opponents, this means also that it might cost us. It cost Jesus, after all, didn't it? And it cost Paul. Look what it says in verse five here. After he did this reasoning, explaining, convincing, it says the Jews then were jealous 
And so taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who've turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar. So very similar response as in Philippi, saying that there is another king whose name is Jesus. So the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they'd taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they basically took a bribe. So what I'm saying here is taking this like humble, gentle, loving route doesn't mean it's going to be a humble and gentle route, right? This might not go well for us, but this is what we see modeled. But what I love is what they say here. They, they say, these men turned the world upside down. What a great thing to be said about you. Wouldn't you love if your friends would say that about you? Man, you just you turned my world upside down with the way that you talk the way that you share about your faith. That's just, this is crazy. Now that statement that these Jews make, that's only partly true because the world actually is already upside down. So it wasn't the disciples that turned the world upside down. The world was, the Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica was already upside down. The disciples are actually turning it right side up. You and me, our job is to go into people's lives and help turn their lives right side up. All right, so it's only kind of partly true here. And look what Paul writes to the Thessalonians later on. This is, I love this, that we see this. If you read through uh, 1 Thessalonians, you'll see him refer to this instance here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says to the Thessalonians, you yourselves know, brothers, that when we came to you, it wasn't in vain. Though we'd already suffered and we'd been shamefully treated at Philippi, right? We just read about that last week. We suffered at Philippi, and you know we had the boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of such conflict. We weren't afraid of what happened in Philippi. We still went to you and we preached the gospel. Our, our appeal doesn't spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but please God who tests our hearts. It says, we didn't come with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is our witness. We didn't seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but it says, instead, look what Paul says to the Thessalonians. But we were gentle among you. We were gentle, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And so being affectionately desirous of you we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but we wanted to also share ourselves with you, our lives, our hearts with you, because you had become very dear to us. Now, sadly, their time in Thessalonica is cut short. Verse 10 tells us the brothers immediately then in Thessalonica sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, which we're gonna look at next week. But that didn't hinder Paul and Silas' love for the Thessalonians who became followers of Christ. Look what he says Continuing in verse 17 in 1 Thessalonians, he says, since we were torn away from you, speaking of this event at Jason's house, since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, but only in person, not in heart. Those guys couldn't tear our hearts away from you guys. We were torn away in person, not in heart. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire. We wanted to see, we wanted to come back and see you face to face. Our time was so short because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, I tried to come back to you to see you guys, but Satan hindered us. What's our hope or our joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Isn't it you? You are our glory and our joy. Listen to Paul's love for these Thessalonians that he dialogued with, that he explained, that he tried to convince. Later on, he's writing a letter saying, you guys are our glory and our joy. Going down, uh, verse uh, three, you yourselves know that we're destined for this. Speaking of afflictions, he says, I don't want anyone to be moved by the afflictions that we went through. You yourselves know that we as believers, we're destined for affliction. When we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction. 
Just as it's come to pass, and just as you know, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. So because he was separated from them, it was driving him crazy. He didn't know what was going on back in Thessalonica. So what he did is he sent someone to go give a report. He goes, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent someone to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So verse seven, for this reason, brothers, he sent Timothy in our distress and affliction, We've been comforted about, your, uh, about you through our faith, your faith. For now we live, if you're standing fast in the Lord, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So once again, Paul, like in Philippi, the beatings, the trials that they endured for the sake of the Roman jailer, for Lydia, for the demonized girl, and now for these followers in Thessalonica, it is all incredibly worth it to Paul. And he says in verse 13, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God and Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. So the Thessalonians, they've also now endured some suffering, just like Paul did. He says, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. So church, the world already thinks that we're living an upside down life. And it could be our aim to have the approach of Paul, which really was the approach of Jesus, to be clear and simple, patient and gentle with our dialogue, giving the sense of things so that people can understand, not expecting them to meet us on our turf, but us meeting them on their turf. If they already see us, we're already seen as living upside down lives, we need to have used language and an approach that's accessible to them, and not all will receive it. But for those that do, it will be so very well worth it for us. And I need to ask myself, can I honestly say to my listeners in my life, as Paul said, could I speak to my boys and the Fight Club boys and my friends, my non-believing friends, can I say to them, I was gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being effectually desirous of you, I was ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also my own self, because you became very dear to me. That's what I want to be able to say to everyone who hears the words that come out of my mouth. Every non-believer in my life, I hope I can say I was gentle among you and I wanted to share not just the gospel and what I believe, I wanted to share my life with you. I want that to be my motive. I want that to be me. I hope that is what you want for you. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to follow Paul as he follows Christ, follow the model, the plate approach of Paul, the plate approach of Christ himself being gentle among our listeners, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, not just sharing the gospel and what we believe and waiting for them to close their mouths so we can open ours, but actually sharing our lives, our hearts with them, being the kind of people who want to draw out the deep waters of the people in our life. We need God's help and wisdom for that. We need sanctification for that. We need to be made more and more into the image of Christ himself. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are at work in us. That you also are drawing out the deep well of our hearts. You're excavating, drawing out the purposes of our hearts, the motive of our hearts. You're exposing what's inside of our hearts, the things that hinder us even from wanting to share the gospel with certain people or wanting to love certain people. You're doing this in us, and we want to also be able to do this in other people's lives, drawing out the purposes of their hearts, excavating, dialoguing, thoughtfully, lovingly, gently, knowing that not everyone is going (laughs) to listen to what we have to say, not everyone's going to agree with what we have to say, but we want to at least 
be the kind of people who reason with others and dialogue with others. Who love our enemies and love enemies of the gospel. Desiring to see them be saved. So help us, Lord. Teach us. I know that not one sermon is going to just all of a sudden help us to be better evangelists, better missionaries. But as we just kind of keep adding week by week, day by day, new bits of knowledge or wisdom, sharpening, not just in one sermon, but sharpening each and every day, would you help us just keep adding to our, our plate approach, adding more tools to the toolbox, sharpening the tools that are already in the toolbox. So help us, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, your love towards us, your patience towards us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen.